Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. Toronto has long been a home to Canadian football. In 1873, the Argonaut Rowing Club decided that the new game was a perfect way to keep their rowers in top condition. In 1909, the University of Toronto captured the first ever Grey Cup championship. The Argonauts earned their first Grey Cup in 1914, and their 1921 victory featured the game's first superstar, Lionel Big Train Conacher. The colorful Anis Stukas led the Argos to back-to-back -back championships in 1937 and 38. And Toronto continued to dominate the game through the 40s, led by a one-two punch known as the Gold Dust Twins. The Gold Dust Twins, of course, were the great Royal Copeland and Joe Kroll. In those days, they played a single wing, and Joe was the tailback. He took the ball from center and he either ran with it or handed it off or threw it. And his receiver was Royal Copeland, who was a magnificent running back. And uh, that was their big weapon, Joe throwing the ball to Royal Copeland. Royal Copeland, in my opinion, was one of the greatest running backs in Canadian football. Uh, he not only had speed, but he was a very deceptive runner. Gee, uh, uh, I, I can't honestly remember anybody really hitting him solidly. So he was just a great all-around ball player. Beginning in 1945, the combination of Kroll and Copeland led the powerful Toronto offense as the Argos captured three consecutive Grey Cup championships. But no game in Argo history will ever top the 1950 final against Winnipeg, the infamous Mud Bowl. The Mud Bowl game was one of the great disasters in the CFL. What happened, of course, is that we had a sudden uh, snowstorm on the night before the game, and then it started to melt. And what we ended up with was slush, basically, and water, and it was the most deplorable conditions that you could ever think of. We had a quarterback by the name of Al Dechterbrum, and what he would do would get thumbtacks. He'd file them down, and then he would tape them to his fingers, obviously with the points sticking out. It was wet and cold and muddy, and yet Dechterbrunner was handling the ball like, like it was a, a dry day. He was very effective. He was able to throw the football, not for any distance, but he could throw short passes, and that was all the Argonauts needed to control the play. And the Argos were able to win it, uh, mainly because they did it on their kicking. And of course, their punter that day was Joe Kroll, I was the only guy that had a, a clean uniform because obviously all I did was go in and kick the ball and I came off the field again. Unfortunately, on one of the plays, the snap was bad and I had to pick the darn thing up and run with it. 25, down the 20, down to the 15-yard line for Joe Kroll around the left end. We made a first down, but uh, even, even my own teammates had great delight in, in seeing me fall down in the mud. In 1952, Toronto was again the top team in the game. Running back Ulysses Curtis shattered Lionel Conacher's team rushing record. And in the Grey Cup, quarterback Nobby Workowski led the team to a 21-11 victory over the Edmonton Eskimos. 
For the remainder of the 50s, the Argos struggled. But as a new decade began, Toronto fans found hope. In 61, the Eastern Final, the Argonauts went into Hamilton to play the Tiger Cats. They, it was a two-game total point series they had in those days. They'd won the game in Toronto by 18 points. They went into Hamilton. It seemed no way they could lose. Somehow we, we scored uh, enough to, uh, to tie the ball game late in the game. We went into uh, two overtimes and uh, beat them by four touchdowns. The team defensively and offensively just really clicked. While the Argos saw little success, fan favorite Dick Shadow remained one of the top players in the game. After 12 highlight-filled seasons, he retired with CFL records for both receptions and touchdowns. From 1962 to 66, the Argos recorded five consecutive last place finishes. Looking for leadership, the team recruited Toronto Rifles coach, Leo Cahill. My first year with the Argonauts was a scary year. We had some guys on that football team that uh, were real characters and uh, coach killers. I, I got rid of a couple of those guys in a hurry and, and uh, started building from there. And uh, I think they started getting the idea that uh, there was going to be no nonsense on the football team. A 1967 trade with the BC Lions brought Coach Cahill a tough running back who could do it all, Bill Simons. Bill Simons was one of the finest guys that I ever coached, and uh, to go along with that, he was just a great football player. He was a National Football League type back. He was big, he was strong, he could catch the ball, and he could run. He had some great years for us. When I came to Toronto in 67, I was playing, we had started building a team that was all character. Most of the guys had come from some other team and had been traded, and we kind of put a bunch of renegades together. And Leo was good at uh, that, molding, uh, molding a bunch of guys. And we started believing in ourselves that we, could, we were going to win. Among the new recruits, running back Leon McQuay, defensive end Jim Corrigal, and the quarterback people told Cahill he'd never get, Notre Dame's Joe Theismann. Leo Cahill was one of the great recruiters. He could talk people into almost anything. He, uh, Joe Theismann came, uh, was going to go with the Miami Dolphins. Leo brought him to Toronto, sat down and convinced Joe that he should play with the Argonauts. They had a big press conference in Southern Florida and uh, uh, Joe pretty well agreed that he was going to go with the Miami Dolphins. And when I heard this, it was on the wire and in the newspapers, I picked up the phone and I called him and I said, Joe, you really uh, deserve to speak with us again and maybe we can come to some conclusions. He came up and we signed a contract. In 1971, Joe Theismann and the Toronto Argonauts were in the Grey Cup. Late in the game, Toronto trailed the Calgary Stampeders by three. With a chance to set up a tying field goal, Coach Cahill called a handoff to Leon McQuay. So Leon got the ball and swept to his left, and uh, when, he, when he got about to look at the off-tackle play to his left, it opened up like a suitcase, and he planted his outside foot, and his feet went out from under him. That was a very wet field. When Leon slipped, his elbow hit the ground and bounced the ball out, and it was just one of those circumstances. Now the rule as far as football is concerned is that the ground can't make you fumble, but under the circumstances, the referees call it the other way. The fumble ended Toronto's Grey Cup dream, but as the Stampeders celebrated, Leo Cahill felt certain that things were looking up. 71, I was coach of the year, and I said to myself, uh, 72, we're gonna win it all. And then we had seven injuries of starters on that football team, didn't make the playoffs, and I was called in and fired. Leo Cahill is always going to have a controversy around him. He spoke his piece, he loved the media, he always had uh, something to say, the press loved him, and I think if he did bring uh, a great amount of interest to the Toronto Argonauts. Over the next 10 years, the Argos would see eight head coaches and eight last place finishes. A 1981 trade with Ottawa brought quarterback Conrich Holloway to Toronto. The team won only twice that season, but Holloway remained confident. Going to Toronto was one of the best things that ever happened to me. 
I got a chance to be thrown in the fire and either sink or swim. And I held my guns there and decided I was going to stick it out. And I, I felt that we could turn that team around. Kyrie Holloway was one of the toughest players I ever coached or, or ever saw compete because Conridge would rather get hit than throw an interception. He was just a tough, gutty guy that, uh, you know, he would lay it all on the line to win. In 1982, head coach Bob Obilovich installed a high-speed pass-oriented offense known as the run and shoot. In a single season, the Toronto Argonauts climbed from worst to first. We had a high percentage of completions. We gave the defenses a lot of problems. And it caused the defenses to become more creative, too. They, they had to deal with this now more than ever before. Uh, there were some major adjustments with the defenses once we started showing what we could do with that offense. They always isolated Terry Greer. And I don't think anybody at that time, when he was playing at his best, could cover this receiver. And the run and shoot all came off of him because you had to adjust your defense to stop him. So. If you had to put two men out on Terry Greer, you were playing one man short against that offense. Last play of the game, ball's in the air, game's on the line. There's only one guy that I want going up for that ball for me. That's Terry Greer. And he's going to catch it, and he's going to score. In 1982, Conridge Holloway and the Toronto Argonauts faced the Edmonton Eskimos in the Grey Cup. Although the Argos would fall to the Eskimos, their fans felt the moment worthy of celebration. I bet you that's the only team that ever played in the Grey Cup that didn't win the Grey Cup that got a downtown parade. We had about 25,000 people downtown, and I remember telling the players after that parade, you can imagine what this is going to be like if we ever win the Grey Cup. The following year, the Argos got their chance. In Vancouver's BC Play Stadium, the hometown Lions got off to a strong start. As Holloway struggled against the powerful Lions defense, Toronto fell behind. BC was up the first half. And, uh, you know, I had a little bout with the flu, but I don't think I was playing that well. And Coach Abilovich made a switch. Joe Barnes came in and played exceptional. Uh, won the most valuable player trophy, and we won the Great Cup. And, uh, I think uh, it's just a total team effort and so many people contribute, but you know, Joe coming in and playing, probably the biggest contribution. 1983 marked the Argos' first Grey Cup victory in 31 years. Four years later, the team had another chance at a championship, but the play Coach Abilovich will always remember is a 115-yard return by Edmonton's Gizmo Williams. As a coach, that's the closest I've ever been to tackling a player on the field. <laughs> when Gizmo went past the bench, I knew we were in trouble, and I was tempted. I really was, and I, I could see what was happening. Uh, that 87 Grey Cup game that we lost was all because of special teams, poor play on special teams, or good play by them, however you want to look at it. Soon, Bob Obilovich and the Toronto Argonauts would have a game breaker of their own. Five foot six speedster, Michael Clemens. We were at training camp the first year we had him there, and we were running short yardage plays, and he was running out of the tailback spot. And he went into the line, he bounced here, and bounced over there, here, and, and I laughed, and he kept going. <laughs> I said, that guy's like a pinball out there. I went for 24 years without a nickname. I was here a week, and Coach Bob Obilovich made a statement to the media that we have this new guy that bounces around like a pinball, and it stuck. Mike was playing, he was on the highlight film. You know, you look at the returners and the guys that are punt returning, kickoff returning, playing receiver, playing running back, accumulating all purpose yards in the league today. And then you pull out a tape and watch pinball and what he did when he was playing, it's not even close. Just like a top hitting the side of a, you know, of a cabinet or something, just bouncing off and just spinning down the field. That's the way pinball was. 1991 brought a new head coach, Adam Rita and new ownership. The Argos went showbiz as Bruce McNall, Wayne Gretzky, and John Candy shook up the city. 
People were genuinely excited about the Canadian Football League in Toronto. You had 50,000 people at, uh, at the home opener. I remember the Blues Brothers were performing at halftime. There was a real excitement about the, um, about the football team. And of course, the focal point of that excitement was the signing of Rocket Ishmael from Notre Dame. Signing Heisman Trophy winner Ishmael cost the Argos new ownership millions. But when he took to the field, it looked like money well spent. He was an exciting player. Every time he touched the ball, it could have been six. It felt like that when he, when he had the ball, because I don't think I've ever seen a guy that was so fast. He just had unreal speed. Some guys are real fast when they don't have equipment on. You know, you can run a good 40 times, but football speed is different, you know, when you got the equipment on. And, and so he had great football speed. In 1991, the year of the Rocket, um, Bruce McNall, John Candy, Wayne Gretzky, the whole Toronto Argonaut euphoric ex experience was, was just a joy ride. It turned out to be one of the most extraordinary football seasons, I think, in the history of the CFL. After capturing the Eastern Final, Toronto headed to the Grey Cup game. But a dark cloud hung over the Argos. A shoulder problem made Matt Dunnigan a doubtful starter. There were really a lot of questions about whether Matt Dunnigan would play because of a sore shoulder he had. He was very coy that entire week about whether he was going to play or not. But the Argos, the day before the game, took him into the hotel, uh, the hotel they were staying at, took him into a, a ballroom and uh, had him throw there. And that's when the decision was made that he was uh, fit enough to play. I felt like I'd played long enough. If I screwed my shoulder up to the point where I couldn't play again, then I felt at that point it was worth it. You know, I'd given it my best shot. And um, who knows if you're ever going to get back to the Grey Cup. Facing the Calgary Stampeders, Dunnigan put on one of the grittiest performances in Grey Cup history as the Argos defeated Calgary 36-21. For Dunnigan, the victory made it all worthwhile. The pain after the game, uh, yeah, yeah, it hurt. You know, you know, it didn't matter at that point. It won the pinnacle. It won the Grey Cup. After the 1991 Grey Cup, Toronto sank to the bottom of the East. In 1996, coach Don Matthews arrived, hoping to right the ship. Don Matthews understands how to win, right? uh, Probably the best coach uh, I've ever played under. I think simply said, he knows how he wants to play the game, and he's very good at surrounding himself with the right personnel in order to do that. I believe that I teach the players to expect to win, and that's one of our attitudes. So every time that we go on the football field, I want my football team to have the attitude that we expect to win. We don't hope to win, and we don't think we can win, but we expect to win. Matthews found a quarterback who knew how to win, Doug Flutie. And to put together the game plan, he recruited former Argos head coach, Adam Rita. When I went to Toronto, Adam Reedham was the offensive coordinator, and Adam basically put in a couple of things early in the beginning of camp, and then after that said, you know, whatever you want to do, we'll do it. I was at a point in my career where I really understood this game, and I basically implemented my own offense and the things that I wanted to run and called my own plays and just went out and had fun. Doug Flutie made us feel as a team, anytime we stepped on the field, we were going to win the football game. Didn't matter what point in the football game it was, didn't matter how many points we were up or down, because Doug Flutie was the quarterback, we were going to win. In 1996, on a snowbound field in Hamilton's Iverwind Stadium, the Edmonton Eskimos and the Toronto Argonauts prepared to battle for the championship of the CFL. The 96 Grey Cup was Canadian Football League at its best. It was snowing. They were plowing the sidelines. It was one of those classic Canadian winter days. It did not feel cold. I don't know what the temperature was that day, but the snow just kept piling up, and the snow was piling up in a hurry, and it be traction became a definite problem. I couldn't stand up. The footing was challenging, if you will, and, and in that kind of game, you expect that you're going to have a defensive battle. It was one of the great games as far as scoring. No matter what the conditions were, uh, balls were going to the right individuals, uh, guys were returning kicks, uh, field goals were going through it. 
the elements had played no part in that game. It was just a, a great football game under some pretty tough conditions. Eddie Downtown Brown made the greatest single game catch I have ever seen. In the first quarter, he caught a, uh, a bomb pass. It went through his hands, hit his knee, then hit his foot, came back up, he grabbed it in his hands, and ran into the end zone untouched for the touchdown. Offense was the name of the game as both teams managed to overcome the elements. In one of the most thrilling Grey Cup showdowns in CFL history, the Toronto Argonauts recorded a 43-37 victory over the Edmonton Eskimos. For as bad as the weather was, as far as the snow and the slipperiness went, that was one heck of a football game. But we couldn't stop them, and they had a heck of a time stopping us. When you look at it from a fan standpoint, it had to be a great game to watch, and uh, it had a lot of excitement for everybody, and that's what the game should be about. The following year, Toronto was back in the Grey Cup. The Western champion Saskatchewan Rough Riders were no match for Flutie and the Argonauts and Toronto romped to a 47-23 victory, their first back-to-back -back championships in 50 years. I think we were the uh, heavy favorite going into the game, and, and with the season that we had, a 15-3 regular season record, I think we had a little bit too much team for Saskatchewan that day, and I think the score indicated that. The only thing that is tougher than winning a Grey Cup is repeating. And so the 97 year, there was a, a, a level of appreciation of what it's like, not just to get to the, the top level, not just to be the best, but to stay there. We had two great seasons back to back, and a lot of fun. We had loyal fans that were there week in and week out that had a blast with us, enjoyed the ride to win back to back Grey Cubs. We just had a lot of fun. In 2000, his 12th season with the team, Fan favorite Pinball Clemens made the move from player to coach. Two years later, he added president to his title. In the 130 year history of the Toronto Argonauts, one thing has remained true, the passion for the Canadian game. The Grey Cup, our, our title game, right, is still the biggest event that happens in Canada on a yearly basis. And the Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. I think that says it all.